it is sort of a Shakespearean tragedy, so much potential and a lot of talent as you write, you know, just right. a deeply, deeply flawed person whose flaws I think were uh, amplified and exacerbated by power, which is so often the case with so many of these people. Did you feel ambivalent in some ways about Harvey? Because I know it was important for you to write about a person, Ken, as a multidimensional human being and not just as this grotesque monster we've come to know in recent years. No, that, that was a, a, a real challenge. I was not writing about a cardboard cutout figure. Biography should not feel like a prosecution brief. You want to capture a whole man. And this was a guy who was a monster, but he was also a very talented man who brought to the screen an incredible array of, of movies. And, and the relationship with the brother, his use and abuse of power, the role of his mother and what happened in his childhood, all those were, were really pregnant for me to explore. And it's something you've been exploring for, gosh, Ken, 20 years, because you wrote that New Yorker profile back in 2002. Uh, you confronted him about allegations of sexual assault back then. Um, and he denied it. He denied it. Um, tell me about that conversation and that confrontation. Well, the conversation, it was, it was our last interview. It was a small conference room at one of his offices. And I said, Harvey, tell me about how you abused Rowena Chu at the Venice Film Festival. And he stood up and I was seated at a small conference table. He stood up over me, clenched his fists. His lower lip was quivering and he started screaming at me. You're gonna ruin my marriage to Eve. You're gonna destroy my, my three young teenage daughters' privacy and, and shame them. And this was a consensual affair and I broke it off and she was threatening to expose my family and I had to stop. And at that point, since I'm seated, that was a, a tar an easy target for him to throw a punch at. I stood up and faced him. And at that point, Harvey really surprised me because what he did was he started to cry. He literally, and I don't mean a tear rolling down his cheek, I mean bawling, crying out loud. This is terrible, you can't write this, it's just awful. And I had hoped to write it, but I couldn't get the two, Rowena Chu or the other woman, Zelda Perkins, uh, to talk to me. I tracked Zelda down to Guatemala where she was raising horses. And she, she said, I signed, no, I can't talk. They both signed non-disclosure agreements and they challenged them. And, and, but we, the, David Remnick, the editor of the New Yorker said, we don't have anyone on the record. We're not the National Enquirer. We can't run this story. And I totally agree with you. It was also a very different time in 2002, wasn't it, Ken? Um, I mean, and I don't say that in a way that's particularly laudatory. I mean, it was a time when stories like this made the rounds. And I mean, not just at, in Hollywood, but in various media outlets, as you and I know well. And it, it just wasn't taken as seriously, was it? Well, I, one of the reasons the subtitle of my book is The Culture of Silence, is that people knew or should have known and kept their mouth shut. And, and this allowed Harvey to continue to abuse women. When he, when he was revealed to be a sexual pervert in, in October of 2017, over 100 women came out of the closet and said, he did it to me too. That was amazing. So people, I, I think the same thing would not happen today. In that sense, you're absolutely right, Katie. I think many people today, because of the exposure of people like Harvey and, and many other men would not put up with it. They would, they would blow the whistle on it. Of course, you give a lot of credit to Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy, who did an incredible job exposing uh, Harvey in the New York Times, as did Ronan Farrow, who you helped in terms of introducing him to David Remnick at the New Yorker. Um, how frustrating was that for you? Did you feel like this man, this is the one that got away. I was off doing a book on another subject. I was not competing with them. I was thrilled when Ronan came to me, interviewed me, and I said, what have you got? And he told me, this is, he was doing it for NBC at the time. He said, I've got three women on camera saying Harvey raped or, or 
sexually assaulted me. I've got five women on camera, but shielded, the name shielded. And I've got the audio tape of the Italian model who Harvey grabbed her breasts in 2015. I said, my God, you've broken the case. I, it was, I was thrilled by it. And I, it wasn't competitive because I wasn't, I wasn't chasing the same story they were at that point. So I was just thrilled that this guy was gonna be stopped. You were at first a little uh, skeptical about Ronan Farrow because of his position on Woody Allen and uh, sexually assaulting his sister, Dylan. And you thought he might be a zealot uh, rather than an objective journalist. But he convinced you that that wasn't the case. How did he do that? Well, he just asked good questions and he wasn't certain about some things. He just, he sounded to me more like a, a, a skeptical reporter than a zealot. And, and I was thrilled. To, and when I called Remnick and said, I think Ronan Farrow has broken the case and we, we should, you should look at him for the New Yorker. The word I used was, I said, David, he's judicious. And I, I, he convinced me he was, and he still convinces me he was and is. I worked for NBC, of course, as you know, Ken, for gosh, 20 plus years. And I've always been intrigued, fascinated, and quite frankly, a bit confused about NBC's role in, in basically, you know, uh, shutting down this story. Um, you write, two conclusions seem unassailable. First, NBC killed a story, even though Ronan Farrow had solid evidence that Harvey Weinstein assaulted women. Second, NBC confided, confided to Harvey Weinstein before telling Ronan Farrow his story was dead. You know, you give a number of theories about why NBC sort of reacted the way it did from Noah Oppenheim didn't want to piss Harvey off because he had, you know, was the screenwriter for Jackie and wanted to keep the doors open to his movie career to that Harvey might have some goods on Matt Lauer and he was using that to threaten NBC if they went forward with the piece. Um, you know, now that you've done so much reporting on it, Ken, what do you think about the way NBC handled this story? I think it's a disgrace the way they handled the story. I don't know why they killed Ronan's story, but I know this, they claim, and, and at one point, uh, someone came up to me, I was doing Morning Joe one morning, they said, would you have lunch with this Makamak at, at NBC? And I said, yes, but you have to keep his name off the record, which I have, and I, 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 but I recount what he said to me in, in a, at our lunch. And he said, Ronan didn't have the story at NBC. I had two women from Dateline screen what he had and he didn't have it. He only got the story when he went to the New Yorker. So when the story was reported, they said, Ronan says this and NBC says that. I said, but wait, there's a third party to go to, to find out who's telling the truth. So I went to the New Yorker and I, I talked to Ronan's editor, Deirdre. And I said, Deirdre, when, when Ronan came to you in August of 2017, what did he bring to you? And she said to me, he brought three women on camera saying he, they were abused. He brought five women who said they were shielded, they were shielded, but they said they were abused. And he brought the Italian model audio tape. So the evidence was there and Harvey's people acknowledged that they were told by NBC at least a week before Ronan was told that the story was dead. So those two facts to me are unassailable and, 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 and put NBC in a very bad odor. Now, why NBC made the decision? We talked about the theories I, I present. I don't know the answer to that, but, I, I, but it sure smells. Ken, one of the most interesting parts of the book was when the world was closing in on Harvey. They were about to print that piece, that damaging piece, that career ending piece in the New York Times. And he was like, you know, he was like a cornered rat. One of the things I tried to do on just the point you're making is, is try to tell the story climbing inside Harvey's head and looking at the world as he saw it. and 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 how I can get the charges dismissed or I can stop the Times or the or NBC from running the stories about me. And I wasn't looking in the glass inside what is happening. I was trying to look out from Harvey's side. And it's appalling it, it, how he, he fooled himself to think 
he can get away with this stuff. I have, I'll, I'll put a finger in that deck. I'll stop the, the dam from flooding. And then he drowns. This book, as I mentioned, isn't just about Harvey's transgressions, Weinstein's transgressions. You're giving a comprehensive account of his life and career. I found the childhood stories really fascinating because I'm very interested in generational trauma and how the way you're shaped as a child really impacts you later in life. But you, you talk about how it was really challenging to see this whole person. And you say you don't want to, you didn't want to write about a cardboard cutout, but some people have questioned whether someone like Harvey Weinstein deserves a, a deep dive and a 360 assessment by someone of your stature. Well, I mean, I, the, someone in the review in the Washington Post that was, that was, you know, complimentary to me, the report, the, the person who reviewed it, a college professor, nevertheless said, why do we, why, why are you making us a monster sympathetic? I'm not making a monster sympathetic. I'm, I'm portraying who are the monster, but I'm also portraying a guy who, who distributed or produced movies like Shakespeare and Love, My Left Foot, Sex Lives and Videotape, I mean, The Crying Game, you can go on and on. And, and how did he do that? Was it just, was it because he was a monster or does he have some talent? And what was his talent? I think readers want to know that. Well, they should want to know that. Biography is about a whole person's life, not just about a slice of them. That so he was a talented monster. Oh, no question. He was a talented monster. And by the way, also a monster who is capable of charm and charisma. And, and, and that's part of the story, too. And by saying it, you're not making him a sympathetic character. You just make him a whole character, a human being. Let's talk about that childhood. His mother, Miriam, was one tough cookie. His father, Max, was... Um, kind of a disappointment to his wife and to his family, sort of never made made as much money as Miriam wanted to. Meanwhile, she was just a screamer, would denigrate her boys. Um, and, and I'm curious how you think she shaped Harvey, because one of the things I found interesting about the book, Ken, is you did talk to a lot of experts, psychologists, and people who are knowledgeable about sociopaths and, 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 and why people behave this way and the forces that shape them. So what is your take on the role Miriam played on Harvey's behavior as an adult? I, I don't think there's any question that, that the yelling that was so common in the house, so common by the way, that Harvey's friends played poker at a different house every weekend, but they would never agree to play at the Weinstein house, why? because they said Miriam yelled too much. It was too uncomfortable. Harvey, you're fat. Harvey, stop eating that. Harvey this, Harvey that. She was just a yeller. And if you look at Harvey in the office, even Bob in the office, when they started Miramax, they were constantly yelling and, and creating enormous fear in the people who worked for them and the people who came in contact with them. But that doesn't explain Harvey's sexual perversions. And I, I, I wouldn't dare to make a claim that Miriam is responsible for for his sexual diversions, but I think she's responsible for normalizing yelling and screaming in an office. Well, the sex really isn't about sex though, Ken, it's about power. So don't you think maybe feeling so disempowered as a child and feeling so small and uh, worthless in some ways by a parent who basically berated him constantly um, that, that somehow he went, and again, you know, I'm not a, a psychoanalyst, but somehow he went searching for validation and he got that through unbridled and unchallenged power. I, I am, I, I am very wary of jumping off that bridge, um, because to me, it, it risks psychobabble, which I don't want to get into. I, I, I mean, the, the professional people I talked to, psychologists, all were careful to say, this is what we know about sexual deviancy, what we know about people who rape women. Uh, but we, but we want to be clear, Ken, we're not talking about Harvey Weinstein, who not, not been a patient of ours. He's right. someone we know. We want to keep a distance. And I feel the same way. I don't, I mean, it is a plausible that, that Miriam bears some responsibility for his behavior. Yes. Do I believe that it wasn't it, it, power, the word I would use is conquest rather than power. Harvey needed to conquer people and it would verbally conquer them, 
and negotiations conquer them or women conquer them. It, I, in some ways it was less about sex with women than it was just conquering them. And, and, and in the end, I came to the conclusion and, and talking to psychologists led me to this conclusion in part, he was a sociopath. The three definitions of a sociopath, the three basic definitions are narcissism, Harvey qualifies, lack of empathy. If you watched him in the trial as I did every day, when those women were testifying with tears in their eyes, sometimes he fell asleep. He wasn't paying, he wasn't paying careful attention. It wasn't reaching him in his gut in any serious way. And, and the third is lack of guilt. And Harvey has no guilt. Harvey feels like he's a victim. To this day, he thinks he's a victim, not a villain. Tell us about his relationship with Bob, because of course they have the same mom, grew up in the same household, but Bob was a different ball of wax in many ways. Um, and you write uh, uh, about Harvey as having a quote, unhinged Shakespeare-like relationship with Bob. Can you talk about that dynamic a little bit, Ken, and what you discovered? They shared a room in Flushing, Queens. Uh, they were very close. Um, Bob is two years younger than Harvey. Uh, they started Miramax together as equal partners. Bob came up with the idea to name it Miramax after Miriam and Max. Right. Um, and everyone knew that if you want a decision, you had to go only to Bob or Harvey. You couldn't, you couldn't go around them. They, they, were, so they talked five times a day at least. But at some point, Bob became increasingly frustrated with Harvey. He thought he was a narcissist and spending too much time on his own self-promotion and less time on the movie business. And also then getting diverted, starting talk magazine, talk books, investing in the fashion industry, investing in television, getting away from what his major talent was, which was movies, and then spending money because he was out of control. Harvey has impulse control issues. And so he would just spend and spend private planes, you know, picking up checks, uh, uh, lunch tabs for people, dinner tabs for people. And Bob, who was much more of a businessman, was frustrated. But Bob also, another change in Bob, Bob was a, Bob was a fearsome person, as Harvey was initially. But Bob became an alcoholic at some point and went into therapy, treatment, Alcoholics Anonymous. And he, he came to be a very reflective, self-exploring kind of a person. And he was constantly telling Harvey, Harvey, you're a sex addict. Harvey, stop cheating on your wife. You know, he didn't, th he says he didn't know that Harvey was raping women, but nevertheless, he became much more self-aware and he constantly was frustrated that Harvey was not self-aware. And so one day in 2015, and I recount this in the book, at a meeting of the board with Harvey, and which I have the tape of, Harvey said, fire my brother. He wanted to fire Bob and Bob wasn't on the call. Bob didn't know about the equal partners. And then some weeks later, Bob Harvey sucker punched Bob breaking his nose. It was quite extraordinary, but Bob was in a kind of a, it was like a, mar a bad marriage. One day he would wake up and he said, well, I think the marriage will work out. And the next day he'd wake up and he said, I got to divorce my, my, my spouse. In the end, in, when Harvey was exposed in October, 2017, Bob provided the critical vote to fire Harvey. And was extremely helpful, obviously, in writing this book for you. Um, you spent a lot of time with Bob and expressed your gratitude to him for being so open and willing to, to participate. I, I, was, I was very grateful. He spent an enormous amount of time and gave me such insight, not just into Harvey, but into Marion. And, and the early days of the business. And, and so Bob was a very valuable source. I've only talked to a lot of people, but Bob was a, was a really valuable source for me. But Bob, when Harvey was fired, Bob in effect was fired. Bob couldn't even hire a lawyer or an agent because his name was Weinstein. And, and he had a scarlet letter on him as, as did Harvey. Now he's coming back and he's, he's doing some stuff in the movie business, but he had a really tough time. And he stopped speaking to Harvey. They don't speak. And, and in my, I had email exchanges with Harvey from prison and, and Bob would give me documents of, of things that, that Harvey had done. And I would confront Harvey with him in email exchanges that he would dictate his answers to his PR guy. And he said, that's not true. And they were just blatant lies to me because it was true. But the question I wanted to ask Harvey, and, and I did an email, which he, he didn't answer. He answered maybe 25, questions I asked, but the one question I really wanted to ask, Harvey, 
when you put your head on a pillow at night after raping, let's say Jessica Mann, how did you explain to yourself what you had just done? And I suspect that, I suspect Harvey would not have been able to give me the answer I would hope for from a human being. Because I think he would say it was consensual and, and she wanted something from me, I wanted something from her and she, she really came on to me. And, and I, that's his defense. And, he does, in fact, you know, talk about sort of this idea of these relationships being consensual. Um, and a lot of emphasis has been placed on that. Um, he said, sometimes I don't know when it's consensual, trying to learn. Maybe I don't recognize my power in these situations. And you quote a, an attorney to Harvey who publicly proclaimed his innocence, but told you this. Harvey's a sociopath. He is not someone who thinks he did anything wrong and is burdened by a heavy conscience, which Ken, you just said. He believes that if a woman wants something from him, even if he pins her down and rapes her, he thinks it is a consensual act. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that, that um, I, I, I keep seeing with people who have power, not just in Hollywood, is they have this they're vain have a, a they're narcissist they're very and in hollywood one of the things that's really different is that you're surrounded by young attractive women unlike say the auto business and it's very easy for some of these powerful men to confuse a compliment oh mr weinstein that was a wonderful movie oh mr weinstein that was just a great speech you made to confuse a compliment with a come up and and to think these women really want to climb in bed with me well wasn't it ever thus in the Hollywood studio system until it wasn't and perhaps still is? You quote uh, Ilya Kazan's autobiography, A Life, where he says, all young actresses in that time and place were thought of as prey to be overwhelmed and topped by the male, toppled by the male. And he adds that all these moguls like Sam Goldwyn and Louis B. Mayer, quote, went by a simple rule and a useful one. Do I want to fuck her? Basically, he was saying these studio heads were standing in for male moviegoers. And, and, you know, I was also struck by a quote you wrote in the book by Manolo Dargis. Am I saying her name correctly? Yes, sure. Sure. She, of the New York Times. I've never said her name. I've only read it. She says it is the perverse, insistent matter of factness of male sexual predation and assault of men's power over women that haunts the revelations about me, about Weinstein. This banality of abuse also haunts the American movie industry. Women help build the industry, but it has long been a male dominated enterprise that systematically treats women as a class as inferior to men. I mean, you know, in many ways, Harvey was operating in a world where it was, as one of his victims said, the casting couch on acid. And, you know, I mean, it was this, obviously he took it way further than most people, as you said, more than a hundred women accusing him of sexual assault. But how much did the system enable him and embolden him to behave this way, Ken? He, he thought this was normal and, and the system allowed him to think it was normal. No question about that. But the only point I would make, the, the casting couch has, as you're pointing out, a long history in Hollywood. And Ilya Kazan's book, which is a wonderful read, by the way, but, and that Harvey subscribed to that view. Do I want to sleep with, do I, before I cast an actress, is she attractive enough to, to want to sleep with her? No question. But there's a difference between casting couch and rape. Rape is a criminal offense. Harvey was found guilty in a criminal trial of rape. And, and that's different than casting couch. Now, casting couch- mm, I don't know, Ken. I mean, if that assumes that if some, I don't know about that actually. I think right. that if you went back in time, Ken, and looked at some of these women who were in positions of much less power than some of these big cheeses, and they were, you know, against their will, you know, maybe they didn't charge rape, but, but 
I don't, I don't think a lot of those cases, I mean, I'm obviously theorizing here, were consensual. No, there's no question. Mean, Louis B. Mayer abused Judy Garland when she was a young actress. There's no question about that. And, and was that rape? It, it was certainly not consensual. It was not casting couch. It was more than that. So there are many examples in Hollywood of, of over the years of people crossing a line that shouldn't be crossed. But, hard, but, but physically throwing a woman down on the bed and ripping off her clothes, that was, that was what Harvey did. And that's, you know, that's a criminal offense. And it, it's different than sexual harassment or casting couch, or I want something from you if you want to be in this movie. I guess, I guess it depends on what actually happened on that couch, right, Ken? <laughs> and I'm um, not defending it. I mean, it's still a gruesome thing to do, but right. it's different is, is all I'm saying. Well, let's talk about some of the executives at, at Miramax, publicists, agents, Bob, you know, talk about the environment that existed at that company that allowed Harvey to pretty much behave this way. Um, and, and I was struck by many people saying we thought he was cheating on his wife, that he was not faithful, that, that there was a lot of infidelity, but we didn't know he was forcing himself on, on these people. We didn't know he was raping these people, sexually assaulting them and, you know, undoing his bathrobe and exposing himself. And oh, I remember Jody and Megan had one thing where he like masturbated into a potted plant. I don't get this whole thing, Ken, but that's probably for another podcast. But <laughs> I mean, how did he get away with doing what he was doing for so long? And was it sort of willful ignorance on the part of the people around him? Well, certainly it was willful ignorance on the part of some. Let me tell you, for instance, a couple of stories. I, I quote executives like Mark Gill and some others in the book saying they, they would never allow their attractive young secretaries or assistants to meet alone with Harvey Weinstein. Why? Clearly they knew he was perfectly capable of, of physical abuse, not just you know casting catch stuff, but literally assaulting women. I tell the story about Hillary Silver, who comes for a job interview in the 90, late 90s at Miramax. And she, she goes in and she's in the elevator with Harvey and he sees her, she's a very attractive woman. And he says, what are you, who are you? What are you doing? He says, I'm here for an interview with, with Human Resources. He said, come and see me afterwards. She goes for an interview. She walks down to his office with the head of Human Resources. Harvey, without asking the Human Resources head, how, how'd she do? Points to Hillary and says, you're hired. She then goes on a, a vacation trip she had long planned. She comes back three or four weeks later. And she gets a call invited to have drinks with, with the head of human resource, with human resources executive, someone to, one of the four assistants to Harvey and two other executives. And she's thrilled. She said, what a welcoming place. They, they're <laughs> inviting me to have a drink with them the day before I have to start work. And surprise, she goes to have drinks and they say, Hillary, don't come to work here. Why? Because he's going to rape you. He will assault you. So, and she didn't come to work there, but if, Hill, if they knew that Harvey was capable, clearly it was much more widespread the knowledge that Harvey was physically abusing women. And, and now, do, uh, you, do I want to make a blanket, con blanket condemnation that everyone who worked there knew? Of course not. But clearly some people did and kept their mouths shut. Well, and didn't, um, didn't you write about Harvey making people basically I mean, swearing them to secrecy and I don't know, was uh, obviously, uh, yeah, what were they, sorry? Non-disclosure agreements. NDAs. Oh, no, no, I know about the NDAs, but but <clears throat> did he make everyone who worked there sign an NDA, basically? Male or female sign an NDA, never to speak ill of, of the company or its executives. And, and that, that's a blanket statement that, that you could literally keep everyone silent. Because and we should probably point out, Ken, you know, Harvey was enormously powerful in Hollywood. If somebody wanted a career in the entertainment business, going against Harvey Weinstein back in the day would be tantamount to, you know, basically committing career suicide. And Harvey understood something that Donald Trump understands. They believe that fear is essential to having power. People have to fear you. And people feared Harvey. 
and and they kept the that's one of the reasons they kept quiet and didn't do it but the other thing advantage he had he was making really good movies and if you're an ambitious actor director you, you want to be in really good movies you don't want to be in the sequels to, to batman you might want to do that to make a little money, but but to get an Academy Award, you want to be in a serious movie. And and Miramax was making serious movies, and that was a great magnet for attracting talent to work for Harvey. And people wanted to be, you know, have proximity to his power, whether they were publicists, whether they were assistants, whether they were, you know, all the sort of the constellation of people who were working at Miramax and in that world, right? Harvey gave book contracts and, and screenwriting contracts to members of the press. He, he gave huge contributions to politicians, would have screenings at the White House during the Clinton administration and bring Gwyneth Paltrow and her then boyfriend, Brad Pitt, there. I mean, he was a, he was a magnet for attention for people and, and, and a power. What do you make of the fact that there was a lot of emphasis on the idea that some of these women continued to have a relationship with Harvey after they were abused. Of course, when I was writing my own book and kind of trying to um, basically metabolize all the stuff that had come out about Matt Lauer, um, that was one of those things that I struggled with a bit until I talked to a lot of people about the nature of these relationships and the psychological component of trying to um, justify in a victim's mind sort of what had transpired. And I'm curious if, if writing this book, you gained a deeper understanding of those dynamics can that are at play in situations like this. I did indeed. In fact, one of the, the biggest obstacle that the prosecution had to win the case against Harvey in a criminal trial was how do they explain why women who were gonna testify against Harvey, who, who claimed he raped them, nevertheless, in some cases, kept in touch with them, in some cases actually had consensual sex with them afterwards. and and. It, it fed into Harvey's defense argument, which is these, these were consensual and these women wanted something from me. And, and they were ambitious young, young women. And one of the ways that the prosecution overcame that, that problem, they called to the stand Dr. Barbara Ziv of Temple University, uh, an expert. I talked to her actually for my book. You did? Mm -hmm. And she's really smart. And she also testified in the Cosby trial as she did in this trial. And one of the facts she presented 40% of American women who are raped continue to have a relationship with the person who raped them. And then the question is why? It goes to the heart of what you're saying. Women are in denial. They blame themselves. They're fearful of doing something. They don't want people to know. All sorts of reasons. And this, the defense was able to play that out by drawing it out of, the, out of these women in the trial. You mean the prosecution? I, the pro, I'm sorry. The, yeah. the prosecution was able to draw out of these victims at the trial, why they kept silent, why they kept in touch with Harvey. And it was very powerful and it overcame basically Harvey's defense. Because that's I an old chestnut. I read your book. I mean, I read your book and, and quite admired it and, 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 and how you dealt with the Matt Lauer thing, which was obviously a very painful thing for you to go through. And, and these psychologists as they, they did with me, helped me sort out because, you know, that is such a, a, an old chestnut, Ken, isn't it? That, oh, these women wanted something from him and somehow the blame gets shifted on the women in a very sort of misogynistic, patriarchal, not to use those buzz, buzzwords, way. And so, you know, I think it's been so, <laughs> so infused in us as a culture that, those kinds of things are really important to understand the dynamics of a sexual assault victim that might explain her behavior. You, you single out Jessica Mann as having the most impactful testimony during the trial. Why was her testimony in your view, Ken, such a game changer? Well, it, I was, as you were saying this, I, I, I'm so glad you latched on to Jessica Mann here because it, I thought it was, she was the most significant witness for the prosecution. She, the, the, the defense was hammering her. 
for three days she was on the stand and she was crying and, and she, she made a number of mistakes and, and of keeping in touch with Harvey, of seeking his, his help. And, and she was obviously complicated as a human being. And at some point after, after Harvey's defense attorney, Donna Ritorno, just went at her too much. She stopped crying. She looked at the jury and she said, I know many of you would question some of the decisions I made. And I questioned some of the decisions I made. I made some wrong decisions. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, one fact is true. Harvey Weinstein raped me. And that moment, I, I get chills just when I, I recount it now, but everyone in that courtroom got chills. And the jury, who, who had notebooks to take notes, all of them were taking notes when she said that. I just think it was a, a, a moment that was particularly potent. Having said that, the male foreman of the jury, Ken, told you that it was the testimony of the male witnesses, not the female victims, that were most pivotal to their verdict. Yeah, Can I'm you surprised. explain that? I can't. I, I really can't. Because, you know, one of the slogans that Me Too, some people in Me Too, uh, push forward, uh, believe women. I mean, which I think as a journalist is, is crap. I mean, I, I, if you tell me believe what the president or mayor or governor says, I would say, hey, wait a second. No, the, the right slogan is listen to women. And, and I was surprised that he was saying he basically wasn't listening to them. What he was saying is that Harvey's, one of the, Harvey's defense, a former producer said that, acknowledged that Harvey was a sex addict, which was a powerful moment front page of the New York Post headlines that day after he said that, certainly. And then the, the, the foreman of the jury said, I, I was bothered that Harvey Weinstein sometimes didn't seem to be paying attention or falling asleep. And one of the things that was really interesting to me about Harvey throughout the trial, he was passive. It wasn't Harvey take charge, Harvey scissor hands, which was the slogan used to describe him. It was a passive Harvey, slumping in his chair, falling asleep sometimes. It was quite extraordinary. And then the foreman of the jury said one other thing. He said, I wanted to hear from Harvey Weinstein. I wanted him to testify. Now his defense lawyers knew not to put him on the stand because the DA would have just gone at him with so many other things that didn't even come up in the trial of his behavior, which the judge allowed them to do. So, but anyway, you're right. He focused on, on men, not women. Yeah, and, and what, what, who were the key men who he thought really had an impact on the verdict? Well, the, the, this, this lawyer, not lawyer, this producer who Harvey brought on, who, who claimed that Annabelle Skewer, the actress, who claimed that Harvey raped her, um, that she, that in fact she told, confided to him at the time, I did something really bad. I had sex with Harvey Weinstein claiming that it wasn't rape, it was consensual. And, 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 but then the prosecution, prosecutor got him to acknowledge that, well, I know my friend Harvey's a sex addict. And, you know, that, it was like a bomb in the court when he, I mean, the defense, one of the seven people who are gonna speak for Harvey in defense comes out and says he's a sex addict, basically acknowledging in effect he's guilty of, of, of things. It was really an amazing moment, but that was, you know, that was, that was a key witness. You talk about Me Too, and I know you talk about a, a study of Hollywood that was commissioned and Anita Hill was in charge of it. And certainly this is something that I've followed closely. Has Hollywood really changed? Um, what is your sense of that? I mean, I, in the short term, it's changed. I mean, people, I mean, if you talk to studio executives or producers that they, they'll tell you they they don't want to meet alone with the woman or fly in a plane with the woman or they meet they, they they keep their door open but they're very sensitive they not how they're perceived and clearly any number uh, you know the number of men who've been shamed and and basically you know assaulted as as perverts is astonishing people well right now paul haggis is 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 dealing with that the director paul haggis uh, one of many many people mario battaglia the chef i mean Matt right Lapp, right you, you just go down less moon i mean you go down the list of 
and, in fact, you do. I, I know I read the page and I was like, wow, that is a lot of people. It is a lot of people. But the, the question becomes, in answer to your question, Katie, is this a long-term effect? Will it have a long-term effect? I hope it does, but will it? I don't know. Um, I also thought it was interesting that you posited something that got Matt Damon in a lot of trouble in the early days of Me Too, that there are gradations of offenses and not everyone is Harvey Weinstein. You know, they're probably the top offenders. And then there are people whose life ha ha has, there are people whose lives have been destroyed um, like that, that poor professor at Dartmouth who you write about, who, um, you know, took his own life. Um, he so was falsely accused and, and he committed suicide, yeah. But, you know, even people who are not falsely accused, who are, who, who are guilty of, of misbehavior, um, if, if Harvey's a felony, some of that misbehavior is a misdemeanor. It, it's not excusable. But if those people are, are, are willing to acknowledge they did a terrible thing, and they're sorry for it, and they've reformed. We believe in the pardon system, pardons in, in, in prisons. I don't believe in, in the death penalty. I, I, I mean, yet we put many people to death and we don't allow them to, to have a chance to say, hey, I really made a mistake here and I've, I've changed and let me show you how I've changed. And, so, and I, I think we group, as you suggested, too many people together with Harvey. Harvey is extreme, Les Mumbez, what he did is, is close to that. But some of the other people, I mean, Mike Oreskes, is the former AP who forcibly kissed a woman, Al, Al Franken, who was banished, forced to resign. I mean, it's not comparable what they did. Do you think there is redemption for people like Matt Lauer and Charlie Rose? It's very hard when you're that age to come back. I think there's better chance for redemption someone in their 40s or early 50s. But it's just, I mean, Charlie Rose is 80. Matt is in his 60s. Um, it, it's just tough. And also then the question becomes, are, are they apologetic? Are they contrite? Are they, are they acknowledging that they did something wrong? And, and if they don't, there's no redemption. What did you learn from this whole interrogation into the, the life, uh, the heart and the soul, if, if he has either? Of, of Harvey Weinstein. I mean, when you were done with this book, uh, how did you feel about Harvey? I, I felt the way Bob Weinstein felt when he described to me, which I used at the end of the book. He said, there is no Harvey. He has no ability to ref be reflective, to be introspective, to, to look at what he's done. And, and, and the shame he's brought. I mean, his three daughters don't speak to him. His ex-wife doesn't speak to him. Eve doesn't speak to him. Bob Weinstein, his brother, doesn't speak to him. Former friends are no longer his friends. And yet Harvey sits there convinced that he's a, he's a victim and that, and that people, everything is unfair. And if you sat in that courtroom and watched his, he asked to speak before the judge sentenced him and he stood up and made one of the most remarkable talks. First of all, he turned to the women, who, the six women who testified against him and received him in the first row. And he says, I have great feelings for these people. We had great times together. And they're, they're thinking to themselves, great times together? Who, what are you talking about? And then Harvey suddenly switched into, we live in a, in a kind of McCarthy period where, where men are being subjected and, and, and you know thrown out and, and treat it as if they're, they're monsters. And it's so unfair. It's like the McCarthy period. And I'm a victim of that, is what he said. My words, not his. But that's, that's what he, he, he was saying. And to sit there and listen to that, it, it just, it was stupefying that this guy is so divorced from reality. And that's what Bob was saying at the end. He tells a story, he and David Boyce tell the story of taking Harvey at one point to lunch at the Four Seasons. And they're sitting and, and Bob trying to get his brother to be more introspective and, and to smell the roses more. Gets David Boyce to, David, 
tell him about how proud you are of your life and what you've done. And David then, boys, then speaks about growing up on a farm in the Midwest. And my parents would be so proud of the life I've had and the success I've had. And it's so wonderful. And Bob has a tear rolling down his, his cheek, he says. And he looks at Harvey and Harvey looks at David Boyce and says, why are you telling me this? What's this all about? He could not relate to the story. There's no way he could sit back and say, isn't it wonderful what I, Max and Miriam's son has done in the movie business? It was, it was all fury, anger. Uh, but just, also this, this insatiable appetite in every way as someone quote you quoted in the book said he wanted more 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 never satisfied with his accomplishments so it was almost impossible for him to feel pride in anything he did because he was full of you know this insatiable appetite for success that that he didn't understand what it meant to feel gratitude humility or pride really and well said, Katie, I would add one other thing. He was always angry. The anger fueled some of that. And, and, and he couldn't get away from that anger. It just, it just blocked all feeling. I think the book is really, it's just a fascinating psychological study and a look at the whole entertainment industry. It's called Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence. What are you, um, what are you gonna write about next, Ken? I have no idea. I, are you going to take a break? Well, no, I, I, I'm talking about various things, but I'm taking a break now. I'm, I'm basically in, in Bridgehampton um, on a sunny day. And I'm actually this afternoon after doing some interviews, I started reading a new novel. Thanks so much for spending time with us. A lot of time talking about your book and about uh, this sordid chapter in American culture. I really appreciate Ken. Appreciate, I appreciate it, Ken. I appreciate your good questions, Katie. Thank you.